Good morning. I'd just uh, like to start out this morning by welcoming everyone here. Uh, my name is Ron Talton, and I have the privilege of being here with us this morning. And uh, a little wet outside, but uh, spring is here, I guess you could say that. So, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone uh, here this morning, especially if we have any visitors. I'd like to extend a special welcome to you and just ask that you join us in the uh, lounge after the church. There's a bag of... Uh, information, some goodies back there, and, and also it'll give us a chance to, uh, to meet you and, and have a little fellowship. I do want to extend a really uh, heartfelt invitation to all of you for this Friday, coming Friday evening's Tenebrae service. It is called It Is Finished. It is a service of remembrance, reflection, as a choir will do readings and songs we will celebrate communion together. So please plan to attend Friday night, 7 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, continue our worship service with the prayer with Gospel lesson this morning was from the book of Mark, chapters 1 through 11. When they were nearing Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany on Mount Olives, he sent off two of his disciples with instructions. Go to the village across from you. As soon as you enter, you'll find a colt tethered, one that has never yet been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks, what are you doing, say, the master needs him, and we turn him right away. They went and found the colt tied to the door at the street corner and untied it. Some of those standing there said, What are you doing untying the colt? The disciples replied exactly as Jesus had instructed them, and the people let them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and spread their coats on it, and he mounted. The people gave him a wonderful welcome, some throwing their coats on the street, others spreading the rushes they had cut in the fields, running ahead and following after. They were calling out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. He entered Jerusalem, then entered the temple. He looked around, taking it all in. But by now it was late. So he went back to Bethany with the twelve.
morning's scripture lesson comes from Nehemiah 8, 9 through 18. Nehemiah the governor, along with Ezra the priest and scholar and the Levites, who were teaching the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to God, your God. Don't weep and carry on. They said this because all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the revelation. He continued, Go home and prepare a feast, holiday food and drink, and share it with those who don't have anything. This day is holy to God. Don't feel bad. The joy of God is your strength. The Levites calmed the people, Quiet now. This is a holy day. Don't be upset. So the people went off to feast, eating and drinking, and including the poor in a great celebration. Now they got it. They understood the reading that had been given to them. On the second day of the month, the family heads of all the people, the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scholar to get a deeper understanding of the words of the revelation. They found written in the revelation that God commanded through Moses that the people of Israel are to live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. So they published this decree and had it posted in all their cities and in Jerusalem. Go into the hills and collect olive branches, pine branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and any other leafy branches that make booths, as it is written. So the people went out, brought in branches, and made themselves booths on their roofs. Courtyards, the courtyards of the Temple of God, the Watergate Plaza, and the Ephraim Gate Plaza. The entire congregation that had come back from exile made booths and lived in them. The people of Israel hadn't done this for, from the time of Joshua, son of Nun, until that very day. A terrific day. Great joy. Ezra read from the book of Revelation of God each day. From the first to the last day, they celebrated the feast for seven days. On the eighth day, they had a solemn assembly in accordance with the decree. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. We look today at the big reveal uh, of what happens and the, the reveal of, of what happens through the scriptures, and um, we, look, we look at our own, our own selves as well. And so today we talk about um, revealing and, and seeing where we have been, comparing, and, and, even, and even more. And so we've been through this journey. We've seen these words before about where we started. We saw, we saw um, Nehemiah devastated. And sometimes that's where our lives are. We're in that spot of devastation. And we see what he did as he, he learned from, from the, the ruins that he finds out that Jerusalem is in ruins. And he is one of those that has been exiled from Jerusalem. And so he's on his knees. He's in tears. He confesses the sins of Israel as well as his own sins. He realizes that he has favor. He asks for favor from the king. We are reminded that he is the cupbearer to the king. He has favor with the king. And so because of that, he has letters that the king gives to him so he can take them and journey to where he needs to go, which is he's asked the king if he could go back to his home to rebuild what has been destroyed. The king gives him favor. Who's in your spot today? Who's around you? Where is it that God gives you favor? And where are you aligned in the space where you are today for something great to take place? Because God has placed you where he's placed you today. And so Nehemiah takes that time. He's there for three days before he even assesses. And then in the middle of the night, he assesses the situation. We need to also assess the situations where we are. Assess what it is. What has happened for yourself? Assess the situation, and he sees for himself what the status of the walls are. Then he tells others, and the word is rebuild. Rebuild. 
His plans weren't li- liked too much by the enemies, as we have, have seen. There were enemies who tempted him, who tried to trick him, who were not happy to see what was happening. There was internal trouble where people were, there were folks who were gouging other folks within the city. There weren't a lot of people living in the city, but officials were taking more than was theirs, and so people were hungry, and people didn't have what they needed, and they were having to sell their land and their fields. And Nehemiah calls them to task for what they were doing. And they give back what belonged to the people. And so then they, they, they work and they rebuild. And in their rebuilding, they complete the walls. And there's an invitation. There's an invitation for people to come back. And so there must have been around two and a half miles worth of wall that was rebuilt. Many places of that wall were 40 feet tall. They did not have equipment like you and I have today access to. They were building by hand these walls that some imagine 40 feet tall in some places. They hung the gates. They redid the gates. They hung the gates. Two and a half miles around the city and... 52 days to complete the project. If you think about all that, you realize that God was in it. It wasn't just the people, but it was God who was in it that made it possible for this to happen. And so it's not only their home, but it was also um, home to God. And so now today we talk about, about the reveal that happens in our own lives as we look at where we are thus far in our journey with with the Lord. And so people have come back to Jerusalem. They, God has gathered them back. And if you remember in the scriptures, it, it had said, and Nehemiah reminds God, if you do not follow my commands, I will scatter the people. The people have been scattered. God expects us to follow what his word is. He expects us to look at his commands and his laws and to be obedient to them. People were scattered, and now the people have returned. And we see in the scripture where they they paid attention to what the Lord has done. And so it is good to praise God for where you are now and to continue on that journey in our hearts of, of rebuilding our own space. We are the temple of the Lord. It's a holy place, your heart and soul. So it's good to take inventory, assess where you are, get rid of things that aren't good so that you can be that holy temple that the Lord desires us to be. So if you are watching the TV shows of home improvements and and how it is the best day ever when you get to the end and you get to see what's happened with the house that they have taken and remade and you get to see the family enjoy that house or however it is and walk through it for the first time, if you watch any of those uh, TV shows of home improvements and you get to see that, that's the most fun. That's the most fun. And so people have come back and they see beautiful walls and they see their city restored. And that is the reveal. But there's all sorts of renovations that take place. The most important one is what happens in our heart. That is the most important one that we need to look at is what's happening in our heart. Where are we? Where are we in our walk with Jesus Christ? Are we in the right right space? But there's all sorts of reveals and there's all sorts of renovations that take place in daily life. And so I'll show you an example, and the men folk might not understand this quite as much as the women. But, you know, we go to the hairdresser, and, and we go to the hairdresser, and everybody usually goes to a barber or hairdresser anyway, and you might try new styles. And we go to the hairdresser, and we have a good idea. So I had a good idea. I had a picture of my good idea, and I took it to my hairdresser, and I said, I kind of would like to do something a little different I would like to do this. And I showed her the picture, and, and we talked about it. And um, it was going to be, this isn't important, but this is an example, okay? So it was going to be highlighted in a little bit different color. And so I wanted her to, so she does this, with permanent highlight, permanent color. I want you to know that things are not permanent. This life is not permanent here on earth, okay? This is in our permanent residence, our permanent residence is meant to be with the Lord in the end. That's our permanent residence. 
This is temporal, so we need to get it right in our hearts. And so I got home, and it, everything looked very good. And when I washed my hair for the first time using cool water, doing all the things they tell you to do, things changed. I was like a chameleon. So things started in one way, and they changed colors to another way, and permanent was not permanent. And so I thought, well, this was a good experiment right before Easter to try this experiment. And so I I text messaged the hairdresser, and I said, we have a situation Do you have any time free between in the near future that I could come back to see you? She does have time, and so I will go back. And and, um, it's good that we don't have good lighting right now up here, so you can't really tell what's gone on. But anyway, things went on that weren't expected. And so I will wait to go again, and we'll see what reveals next. So who knows for next Sunday what might happen. But anyway, we hope for better results than this last thing, but what was permanent wasn't permanent. And so we look at the scripture and we realize everything that we perhaps put our values in isn't permanent. It'll all go away. Are we right with the Lord Jesus in our hearts so that we know when this life is over, we will be in a permanent residence with the Lord? Are we right in our hearts with Jesus Christ? Have we done that evaluation and assessment in our own hearts to be in the right places? And are we looking at the word and what the word has to say on had to say on this particular uh, passage that we heard today? On the second day of the month, the family heads of all the people, the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scholar, to get a deeper understanding of the words of the revelation. They came to hear the scripture. Because what scattered them was they weren't listening to the words that God had given to them, and they were not obeying God, and they were scattered, and now they have returned. And they decide they come before the Lord. They come before Ezra, the, the scholar, to hear what the word of God has to say. And they found in the revelation it written that God commanded through Moses that the people of Israel are to live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. And as you heard that read, it hadn't been done for years. And why? Why are they supposed to do this? Well, their exodus out of Egypt, out of slavery, they lived in temporal housing for many years as they wandered through the wilderness and God provided for them. And so these living in these, uh, making these like tents out of branches and things was a reminder to them. God had told them, this is a reminder to you of where you have come from. Go and live in these temporal, this temporary space and worship God for a week. You are to do this. And it's during the festival of the seventh month. And so they published this decree and they had it posted in their cities in Jerusalem, go into the hills and collect olive branches and pine branches and myrtle and other leafy branches to make booze as it is written. And so the people uh, have just returned home to the beautiful city that has walls and not all the houses were rebuilt yet, but they listen to what God has to say. And they know that God has banished them before and they obediently obey God to go and get, gather the branches and to spend their time doing what God has asked them to do. They have prayed many times for Hoshana, Lord, save us. And the way we are saved is through Jesus Christ. So the people, they went and they brought the branches and they made themselves booze on their roofs and the courtyards and the courtyards of the temple of God, the water gate, the plaza, the Ephraim gate, plaza everywhere. The entire congregation that had come back from exile made these temporary places to live. And the people of Israel, as we heard in the scripture, hadn't done this since the time of Joshua. And it was a great day of celebration, a great time and great joy as they were obedient to what the Lord had to say. And so Ezra reads from the book of the revelation of God each day, from the first to the last day, they celebrated the feast for seven days. They came together as a congregation of people to celebrate God, to hear God's word, 
to celebrate him on acquittance with what God had asked. And so, Hoshana, Lord, save us, is where we often find ourselves in our lives, that we are in that space where we want God to save us from the situations that we are facing, from, from the places where we are. And we need to look to see where our hearts are. Are we obedient to what the Lord has called us to do and to be? Do we have faith and trust in the Lord that he is above all things and and can indeed is the one who has come to save us? And so no matter where we are in the renovation project of our souls, we are reminded by God to celebrate the goodness of the Lord today. Where have you seen God working today? Where has he worked in your lives over this past several weeks that we've been talking about renovating our souls? Where do you see God at work? Maybe be at work in the craziest of places that you see God's hand. But you need to start looking around and telling others because part of this journey isn't to keep it to ourselves, but to tell someone else the struggle that you've had and how you've seen God working through that for something even better, where you've seen God's hand at work today. Every day you should think about that. You could even jot it down. This is where I saw God at work today. Maybe the journey continues. Maybe it's still hard, but you saw God in that space. And you see where God is in that moment. I probably, I know I've shared this before, but in the, the season after I lost my daughter and I was in the hospital and I was, I was sick in that, in that also and she had died from being sick and I was sick. And I was in the hospital and I saw God in various ways. I saw God as I, I shared with you then. I saw God in, in a simple rose that a young girl who was a daughter of a nurse gave to me. And she was struggling with cystic fibrosis, but she had time. She lost her siblings to cystic fibrosis. But yet she cared for me and brought that symbol of that rose to me. I saw that in friends and nurses and people who hung around in my hospital room. I saw God's presence in those people. The journey was hard, but God was present. And I saw God's presence in that space. So sometimes our journeys are very difficult, but where are you seeing God's presence? I saw God's presence yesterday as I shared with you with Millie and and her excitement to share God's creation pieces with me. I saw it as my son John said, um, was telling, and they were telling about making communion bread, and they use the gluten-free, and they make their own communion bread um, with 12 children, and they have help with the kids, but how they get that all done. I'm not really sure, but they do that um, for communion. They make communion bread to share with others. And so they've been perfecting this recipe so that it would be moist and it would taste good and all that kind of thing. Well, their daughter, their 14-year-old daughter has been working on that as well and in making that. And she said to her dad, dad, why is it that in the scripture, it tells us every time we gather together, we are to break bread And we only do it once a month. Why does it tell us in scripture we should do it every time we gather? John thought, well, I'm not going to tell her that the church doesn't always follow what God says. But I think we will start having communion every week because the 14-year-old had asked the question, Dad, why don't we break bread every week? When we gather together, you see, God is at work in variety of ways. We just need to pay attention to what it is he has to tell us and what he has to tell us today. We are reminded of Hoshana, Lord, save us. In in Israel, you would say, I don't have perfect Hebrew, but you would say Hoshana. And that is the meaning of that is, Lord, save us. We are reminded that the Lord is with us wherever we are. He is our Savior, our Redeemer. He is the cornerstone or should be the cornerstone of our very lives. That is who he is. He is is that cornerstone, and we should make him that cornerstone of our lives. It says in the scriptures that upon this rock I will build my house. 
We are encouraged to share our story. There's good news to be told to a world that needs good news. And it's up to us to tell. It's up to us to tell the stories of how God has worked in our lives today and has worked in our lives. Maybe it seems too simple, but there's somebody that needs to hear that. There's somebody that you need to be ready to tell that you will run into that is is on purpose for God and by accident for you, perhaps. Many are crying, Hoshana, Lord, save us. And they need to know that Jesus is present for them. And so we need to be those people that celebrate what the Lord has done and knowing that there is more to come. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your scripture, your word that shows us, for the prayers that have been said by by prophets and by just people throughout the scriptures, that we can pray back to you. We thank you for Nehemiah, who, who was so heartbroken over the news that he heard, and yet he he was on his knees before you. He prayed to you. He trusted you for guidance, for provision. And you made the way. He was in the right place at the right time to obtain favor from the king. You had provided that space. Lord, may you forgive us our sins, and may you come into our heart to reside this morning. May we invite you in to take residence in your temple within our hearts so that we are assured that if the earth ends today, if our life ends today, that our permanent residence will be with you. And then, Lord, may we shout it from the mountaintops that others will know that you are Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who has come to save us, the Son of God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.